as we will read in our passage, the Spirit helps in our weakness. And so as we come to this time where we hear the reading and then the preaching of God's word, we ask that God would build up our weak points, that the gospel would touch and would mend those spots in our life, and that we would go forward with the grace, power, um, and peace of the Spirit. Today's reading is from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that these things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom God foreknew, God also predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom God predestined, God also called. And those whom God called, God also justified. And those whom God justified, God also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? God did not withhold the Son, but gave him up for all of us. Will God not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charges against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers, not things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We have heard the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God loves you 100. What an incredible passage. I think in the future when it's time to preach that passage again, I think my sermon may just simply be reading that passage slowly. Some passages just preach themselves. Uh, With each of our kids, I remember talking with them about the night that they were born. They were all born at night and of holding them the first time and how I was so ready to meet them and to finally see their face. And over this past year, I've had a conversation with August, who is now four, and we were talking about how much we love one another. And he said that he loved me to outer space. And then he followed it up with, I love you to 100. I love you 100, Dad. And by the way, in his mathematics, that is a lot. When I read this passage, I see Paul putting words to the great mysterious reality in which we all live, that God has demonstrated love for us in the past, yes, even before we were born. Even before anyone else saw our face, God knew us and God loved us. That God also demonstrates love for us in the present. And that God would continue to live out love for us in the here and now and in the ever after. In other words, God loves you 100. And that this love could even be threatened seems preposterous to Paul. I mean, he brings a list, doesn't he? What can separate us? Hardship, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, anything on earth? Anything at all? And what will keep God from loving us? Paul says nothing. Nothing at all will ever keep God from loving us. Now, let me stop right here and ask you a very serious question. And I'm going to repeat it back to you. And I'm going to ask if you believe it. What will keep God from loving you? The answer is nothing. Nothing at all. 
Do you believe that is true for you? Do you see yourself as someone worthy enough to receive divine love? To have someone resolved to love you and to help you no matter what? Do you believe in the abiding love of God? A love that remains. A love that persists. A love that is not dependent upon your performance. Do you believe that? And I want to get very practical uh, with this passage and with our time together today. Each of us carries a voice of shame that puts us down. Now, guilt is having negative feelings about an act that you've done, about something that you've done. And you can, of course, have public shame, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, But um, what I'm talking about when I say that we have a voice of shame, I'm talking about that inner voice of condemnation that we all have. Um, It's secret, it's private, and it's like the personal shame that we often feel. And uh, this shame can be helpful. It could lead us to change our behavior, but living under the weight of shame has actually been linked to depression, anxiety, and low self-esteem. Shame can be helpful. It can inspire us to change our behavior. And when we do something we're not proud of, we can feel personally embarrassed and see our failure. That's the type of shame, that that's the type of negative emotion that can be helpful if you move through it uh, and don't stay in it. Uh, But you know as a church that we don't shame as a church. We point to Christ and we say we need to follow Christ. And when we step out of line, we need to change our mind and ask God to help. So we have to be very careful and remember that shame pushes down and pushes away. And grace and reconciliation reaches out and pulls close. So we have to be very careful with our language. Shame, once again, pushes down and pushes away. But grace and reconciliation, it reaches out and pulls close. And this is very helpful to remember, actually in every relationship that you have, to speak in words that inspire to speak in words that reach out and to pull close. Now, let me ask you again. Do you believe that you are worthy of the divine love that comes to you and seeks to draw you close? God thinks you are. God thinks you're worthy. God thinks you're worthy. And just a little secret that God's opinion should probably trump every other opinion out there. God thinks you are. Paul says this, if God is for us, who could ever be against us? Even that internal voice that condemns. Now, we all have weaknesses, right? Right. Paul says at the beginning, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. He then applies it to praying when we don't know how to pray, when we want to do God's will, but we just don't know what to do. And he says, well, the Holy Spirit meets you in that moment in your weakness and strengthens you. And the Holy Spirit intercedes for you according to the will of God. And though he applies it to prayer, it very easily uh, applies to every other area of our life. The Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. This is what you can consider. None of us like feeling weak. None of us likes seeing our flaws. None of us like remembering when we let our own selves down or lived, uh, let other people down, when we didn't live according to our values, our faith, our ethics. None of us like that. I don't. I'll, hey, this is the one time I will freely speak for you. I don't like feeling that way. But I immediately have to follow it with this. It is exactly in that weakness that we see the strength of God's love for us. It is then in our embarrassments, in our forehead slapping, in our red-cheeked moments that we see the beauty of the past, present, and future love of God. Now, 
So you're going to have to get used to being imperfect, okay? <laughs> you're just going to have to get used to it. A feeling weak and embarrassed and like, oh no, I did something again. It is in your weakness that you see the strength of God's commitment for you. Now, like I said, I want to get really practical. And so I hope that what I have just done is to help you apply it to yourself. And now I hope that what I say next helps us apply this passage uh, to others. If, if we believe Jesus Christ is evidence of God's great love for us, and that that love that reaches out and pulls close is the way that the human family can be put back together with peace, justice, equity, fairness, truth, then I want us to consider something else. I want to help give us a language that speaks to why we are choosing to live a certain way as a congregation. There are people in our city, there are people in our country, and obviously around the world, that have had placed upon them a stigma, a stigma of one kind or another, but I'm about to narrow in on one. And they feel, like Paul, that they are helpless, that they are being led to the slaughterhouse. Now, let me narrow in. Many of our own neighbors who would identify themselves as being part of the LGBTQ community, they feel this way. They have been publicly shamed. And in some cases, they have lost family members. Some have lost friends. Some have lost their church home because their church shamed them or used shaming words. So these individuals know that they are not safe. They're not going to stay around and get abused spiritually, which is what I think it is. Now, we know that there is not a singular uh, gay experience in our community. Sexual orientation and gender identity is one aspect of our human experience. There's also where you are in society, your position in society, or your economics, or your education, or where you grew up. It is all different, and it all impacts us. Gender and uh, sexual orientation is an aspect of human experience. It varies from person to person, just like you and I experience the world differently. And for many years, the stigma and the public shame did very bad things for the health of our friends. Not only that, but public and business policies were designed in a way to discriminate against those in the LGBTQ community. This conversation is not over uh, in our country because the bias against these uh, friends of ours still is ongoing. Let's remember that it was only five years ago. I was not yet in Poughkeepsie. It was only five years ago that the United States Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of same-sex marriages. Five years ago. This is not to mention the hardships faced by our transgender friends when they seek employment or insurance or housing or health care. These are the ones in our community, using Paul's words, who are accused, who are blamed, who are condemned, and who are scapegoated. It was for these, to quote, Paul, to quote Paul, for whom Christ Jesus died and was raised to life, and he is sitting there at the right hand of God, this place of honor, pleading their case. That is how serious this is, that Jesus Christ, that these individuals in our community, these people in our lives, they are the ones for whom Jesus Christ died, was raised to life, and Jesus Christ is at the right hand, that is the place of honor at God's presence, pleading on their behalf, that justice would be done on their behalf in the world. Now, as I have spent so much time thinking about this, I keep coming to this passage. If God is for us, who can be against us? If God demonstrated his love toward the world, then that has to mean everyone. Everyone. God's love. 
Listen, God's love is demonstrated in our weakness. And we demonstrate, or we live out God's love, when we love those who are the most vulnerable and who are the weakest in our community. God's love is demonstrated in our weakness, right? That's what we said. When we feel weak, God comes and meets us in our weakness, and that's where we see the strength of God's commitment to us. We faithfully live out that love when we love those who are the most vulnerable, those being led to the slaughter, those who have been shamed, those who are the weakest in our community. And when I say weak, now hear me, when I say weak, I do not mean that they are less than. I do not mean that they are incapable of self-reliance or self-determination. I mean those who have been put in weak positions, who are vulnerable, those who are often scapegoated like early Christians were and like Jesus Christ himself was. Those who are not in positions of safety. This is why I continue to be enthralled by the fact that we have a growing congregation who give their life to acting on homelessness and poverty and their root causes. That we have congregants who serve uh, immigrants and help them become part of the fabric of our community and who advocate for them. That we have congregants who work in social services, providing services for victims of abuse and their families and that we have people in our congregation who also work with families with disabled family members. We have those who are dedicated to delivering meals to the vulnerable. We have folks who are dedicated to serving and working at the senior center. We have our own medical equipment ministry that serves the community no matter what. All of this, all of this is initiated by God who resolved to demonstrate love for us before the creation of the world before the creation of the world. And when we give to others out of our heart, we are connecting to that love and we are amplifying God's love in the world. And that's how we bring healing and hope to the world. We continually, we continually find ourselves this summer neck deep in scripture that gives us the language and the footing we need to explain how we live. We do not live in shame. We live with God's support. God is for us. We do not live under condemnation. We want to go the way of Jesus Christ, the way that puts the world back together, not the way that it would tear it apart. We want to do that. We want to faithfully embody this divine love and how we choose to think about ourselves and how we choose to think about others. And we want to say to our community, everyone in our community, the words of my youngest child, God loves you. 100 and so do we don't you want to say that god loves you 100 you would have to completely change the the number maybe or to explain what 100 means but god loves you but we demonstrate it it is not enough to say it it is not enough to believe it though those two things are good we need to embody it and think about how we live faithfully into that so as i leave you today I want you to step into your weakness. I want you to lean into your weakness because it is there that you are going to find love's strength. Step into your weakness and you are going to find love's strength. Step toward those in weak positions and you are going to see the astonishment that people have at the divine love that they see working in you. So step forward in your weakness and you're going to find love's strength. And when you step forward and help those in weak positions and come alongside of them, you're going to see their astonishment of the great divine love that is working in you. So as I leave you, God loves you 100. May the joy, may the peace, and the inclusive love of God lift you up and empower you to live this kind of life with joy. And may we join and link arms in this effort to embody the great love of God faithfully in Poughkeepsie and in our communities and towns. Amen.